Today's sermon is entitled, New Life in Christ. Our passage is 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. So in these verses, <clears throat> that's what we see really is evidence of new life in Christ. When we're born again, the new birth is the life of God in the soul of a man. And, and there's, there's evidence of new life. This one being, uh, one of these evidences being this new love for others. And specifically in this passage, new love for other believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because it indicates, really, the family to which we belong. If you're in the family of God, then you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. That just makes sense. But if you do not love your brothers and sisters in Christ, well, it may be that you belong to another family, the family of the devil. Remember, there are only two families in the world. There's a family of God and there's a family of the devil. There's, there are children of God and there are children of the devil. That's the context here where John's been talking about the new birth and what it means to be born again. We've been working on this for the last two weeks. And just to look back to verse 9 for a moment, though, there's, there, he twice mentions being born of God. That's the new birth. That's being born from above. And that God himself would create new life in your heart and soul where there was previously spiritual death. And as a result, he adopts you and he brings you into the kingdom of God. And then in verses, verse 10, John uses the phrase being of God, which means to be born of God, to belong to God, to be birthed by God. <clears throat> so... Immediately coming out of that is now verse 11. So let's pray before we read our text this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is meant for our edification. It reveals who you are. It reveals what you've done on our behalf for our salvation. We pray, O oh God, that as you reveal in your word not only these things, but also your way of truth, that we would follow after you. Give us an understanding of your word. Show us ourselves and our need uh, for our Savior. And we ask that you would glorify yourself in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 John 3, verse 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Amen. May God write the eternal truths of his word upon your heart and mine. So here John zeroes in on <clears throat> loving one another as evidence of the new birth. In the book of 1 John, there are some eight or nine evidences of new life in Christ. So this is not the only evidence of new life, but it's just the most repeated one in 1 John. It's found in chapter 2, 9 to 11. It's right here in chapter 3, 11 through 18. There's a very lengthy section in chapter 4, 7 through 21. He picks up on it again in chapter 5. So this is the dominant evidence of the new birth that John sets before us. There's a principle that whenever there's new life, there will be new love because God is love. And love comes from God. So that's the emphasis or the focus John is presenting. Love is always a tremendous challenge too because we are all sinners we're very self-centered. We're man-centered in any way. When we come to the scriptures, we come to the Bible with our own agenda. Uh, being our happiness is a, is a very high priority for us. Uh, we love to protect ourselves and our perceived reputations. We don't want to get our feelings hurt, so we don't want to risk anything. We, don't want, we want to avoid suffering or trials at all costs. We don't want to consider our own brokenness and how needy we all are. So love in the Christian community today is often fake and superficial because even as believers, oftentimes we operate in the flesh. We just need to be honest about how much we struggle to love others well. So this is going to be a challenge for us today as we consider this command to love. And then on top of that, in Matthew 5, Jesus commands us to even love our enemies. But especially we are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's also an evangelistic power about that that draws unbelievers to want to be inside of the fellowship, inside the circle of such loving, caring concern for one another. So let's walk through this passage. First of all, in verse 11, notice the message. <clears throat> John writes, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. And here it is, that we should love one another. When he says you've heard this from the beginning, he's not talking about... Genesis 1, he's talking about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And if you turn back to chapter 1, uh, 1 John 1, <clears throat> his reference becomes clear. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So there it is, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning refers to the beginning of coming to know the Lord Jesus in His earthly ministry. And then in verse 5, this is the message we have heard from Him, Jesus, and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him there's no darkness. Well, when you put all that together with John's Gospel, chapter 1, where Jesus, or excuse me, where John first met Jesus, it was a life-changing encounter. Among other things, John said there, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, no one can ever come to really meet the risen Christ, even today, without their life being dramatically changed. Because they're given a new heart, and a new mind, and a new life on the inside. Their, their entire life is redirected because they recognize that they have a new master, and they hear their master's voice in and through the scriptures, and they follow him. I mean, they don't make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. And He gives them eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to love Him and to love the Father and the Son and the Spirit and, and God's people as well. And so John is saying, I'm simply passing on to you this message that Jesus Christ gave us and it was from the beginning. So this is nothing new. This is not a new perspective. This is the old message that we should love one another. Well, go with me for a moment to John chapter 13 where He records for us Jesus, when Jesus first spoke to them and told them to love one another. It's, it's verses 33 through 35. Jesus is in the upper room and he's, he's going to be crucified the next day. Not too long after, he'll rise from the dead. He's going to leave and go back to the Father. And so he's nearing the end of his earthly ministry. He's teaching his disciples some final truths before he ascends back to heaven. And so verse 33, little children, Yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Well, he's talking about, of course, departing back to go to the right hand of the Father in heaven. And then in verses 34 and 35, he tells them what they are to do after he ascends back to the Father. This is critically important. This is what you're to do in my absence. Verse 34, a new command I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So what Jesus does, uh, he, he, what does He mean there by new, new commandment? Because even in the Old Testament, we're told to love our neighbor as ourselves. How is this a new commandment? Well, it's new in the fact that it's a higher degree of love. In the New Testament, in the Old Testament, excuse me, you're told to love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, in the way you love Yourself here is not being presented as a negative thing. It's simply referring to the fact that we all naturally care for ourselves. You naturally look out for yourself and provide for yourself. That's inherent, really, in, in human nature. Now, sadly, sometimes people become so delusional or, or mentally ill or and they're in so much pain that they actually take their own life. But inherently, people love themselves and they care for themselves. So in the Old Testament, you're to love your, your neighbor as yourself. You're looking out for them. You're taking care of them just like you would take care of yourself. But now in verse 34, Jesus takes it to a higher degree of love when He adds there in the middle of verse 34, just as I have loved you. So this love that Jesus has for them far surpasses even their concern for, their, for, their self, for themselves because Jesus will lay down His life for them. Now if you go over to, to John 15, verse 13, Jesus said there, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And so the, the higher degree of love is that this would be sacrificial love, that you would give yourself to others in the clear demonstration of your love for them. And then if you hop back over to, to chapter 13, John 13, 35, he says, By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So the evidence of new birth, the badge of discipleship, if you will, that others would see that you're part of the kingdom of God is that you love one another. You know, you're not going around attacking one another. You're not pulling one another down. But you're sacrificially giving your life to your brothers and sisters in Christ. John is saying that that's what you heard from the very beginning. 
And in chapter John 15, verse 12 and, and 17, Jesus re even reaffirms this. He says, this is my command that you love one another as I've loved you. So when he says one another, he's referring to those who are in the family of God. And he keeps the standard so high when he says, just as I have loved you. And just in case that might slip through the cracks, he says again in verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. Very emphatic about this, that we love one another. There's no way you could miss the message here. You would have to try to misunderstand this. So this starts with us uh, here today as we're listening, as we're looking at this passage of Scripture, that we will be long-suffering, we'd be quick to forgive, sacrificial and supportive, and encouraging of one another. And it extends out into our own families, of course, and wherever, really, wherever there are other believers in any of our spheres of influence. It just keeps going out, it's extending out. So if we come back to 1 John 3, as we've had a chance to review some of these cross-references and understand why John says this is what you heard from the beginning, that this is what the apostles heard from Jesus and they're passing on to the church of all ages to come until Jesus returns. So he says in 1 John 3, 11, we should love one another. The word for love here means a sacrificial, long-suffering, lay down your life for your friends kind of love. But today when we hear the word love, especially in Christian circles, it's often used in a very generic and shallow and superficial way. When the Greek word refers not only to sacrificial love, it really even gets into the area of unconditional love or counter-conditional love. It rises to the highest level that you love others, not just because of them, but sometimes in spite of them. That they may rub you the wrong way sometimes. That your brokenness and their brokenness doesn't work well together. You're kind of like oil and water when you get together. Or maybe somebody you're dealing with isn't very self-aware. By that I mean they, whenever they get into conflicts, and it happens a lot with them, they tend to think most of the time it's somebody else's fault. They, they, they can, that they contribute nothing to the broken or strained relationship. Or there may be a personality clash. Maybe you're on a different wavelength socially or you have different interests. And it's difficult to relate to them. And look, there's always a time to speak the truth in love and not just brush everything under the rug or just ignore the obvious problem in the relationship you have with someone. That's not authentic love either. But in seeking to love others well, you, you're constantly pursuing a comprehensive love, a love generated by the Holy Spirit as you're endeavoring to walk in the Spirit. It involves your mind, your affections, and your will. It's a comprehensive love. It has to, it has to come from a new mind where you see people a different way now. You know, we're to see our brothers and sisters in Christ as fellow heirs with us of the grace of God. And when we see men and women for whom Christ has died, that's who we're looking at. We, we see them as those who have been washed in the very same blood of the Lord Jesus that we have, as we have. And there's a kindred spirit. And now we see them in a new way, a way that's different from how we look at the world. Again, as I said earlier, Jesus even commands us to love our enemies. I mean, how impossible is that to do in our own flesh and through our own efforts? But those on the inside of the kingdom of God with us, we're to especially love them and have this mindset toward them. But it goes deeper than just a new mind. It's, it's really with new affections. It has to arise from the Holy Spirit that indwells us such that you can actually have genuine heartfelt love for another person. This is completely platonic. But it's very real and heartfelt. And what I'm saying is this spirit produced love is it's not just stoic. Now, I know sometimes we're, we're stoic, but we just can't live there. there. There are tender affections that we're to have for brothers and sisters in Christ. And then this command is also to affect our will. I mean, at the end of the day, love is a, is a decision. Our, our culture is so immersed in this idea of romantic love that I think that definition has affected how we even understand platonic love or sacrificial love or unconditional love. Because romantic love says, you know, I'm only going to love if I feel like it. Only under these certain conditions. And if you hurt me or disappoint me or I don't get what I want out of this, then I'm done. Obviously, if uh, I'm definitely not saying that our other relationships have any element of romance to them. I'm simply talking about the impact of how we're indoctrinated to believe by our culture what love looks like. And that feel and that feelings always have a, a bigger impact 
than we actually realize that they do. When it comes to this, you know, I'm only going to love if I feel like it. Uh, otherwise, that person's dead to me. But as Christians, we're called to make intentional choices to give ourselves to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And more than just giving ourselves, uh, giving of our possessions and sharing with others when we see that there's a need, we actually give ourselves. We, we extend ourselves. We go out of our way to encourage with words and deeds. And I'd be remiss if we didn't look for just a moment at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. You remember there where Paul's writing about love. He says, love is patient. And well, how antithetical is that for us? as believers in Merritt Island. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I mean, love just, it just keeps going. There's no turning off the spigot. There's just to be this continual flow of love, whether we like it or not. Even when others are not loving to us, we're to keep on loving them. So there's no way we can do this in and of ourselves. It has to flow out of this new life in Christ that we have. And it has to be a fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You remember there where Paul writes in Galatians 5.22. You know what? You remember what first on the list of the fruit of the Spirit is? The fruit of the Spirit is love. So where the Holy Spirit is at work filling and flooding our heart and our soul... The first evidence is, is love for others. That's the message John has for the early church and really for the church for all ages until Jesus returns. So we've seen the message. Let's try to internalize it. We can only live this out by the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us supernatural love. Then point two in your outline is the contrast. Notice in verse 12 there where John gives one example of someone who did not love, literally his own sibling, his own brother. And we see in stark contrast between what real love looks like, this total antithesis of what love is. He says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Now, you know who Cain is. He was one of the sons of Adam and Eve. He's Abel's brother. And one thing I love about John, he just puts it out there. I love how politically incorrect John is. He just says he was of the evil one. That means Satan had control of Cain's life. And he incited him to kill his brother. The evil one has control of every unbeliever to different degrees. But everyone who is on the outside of the kingdom of God, everyone who's not been born of God, is of the evil one. You remember what Paul said in, in Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. He's talking there about the condition of the Ephesians before they became believers. And he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, Following the course of this world, here it is, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So the evil one produces evil deeds. And the epitome of these evil deeds would be to kill someone. In this case, he killed his own brother. Satan's the one who's behind the hatred that leads to someone being murdered. And on a spectrum, every intermediate degree of hatred until it reached a fomenting point of killing someone. So let's just think about this. Because all murder is the product, ultimately, of the evil one. Abortion is fueled by the evil one. America is being dominated by an evil world system. In fact, the world system that lies in the power of the evil one according to God's sovereign plan. There's no struggle going on here between God and Satan. As if somehow Satan's even remotely capable of going up against God. However, according to God's plan... Currently, this world system is under the influence of Satan, and he's allowing him to wreak havoc. Satan is, the, is in the abortion movement. Satan is in the feminist movement. He's in every movement that would try to deceive people into believing their own foolish ideologies that go against the Scripture. Ultimately, Satan's behind these mass murders. You know, when we see these gatherings of people, somebody goes in there and they start shooting everyone. Satan's behind that because this goes far beyond just natural depravity. Satan, the, the devil, is pouring gas onto the fire of the flesh and taking someone to such a degree that they're acting in a way that only Satan himself would instigate and inspire. And there's also a sense in which these people have been given over to the desires of their own heart, you know, the influence of Satan upon their heart in a Romans 1 kind of way. In fact, the, world, the problems that we have in the world today are due to, of course, it's the sinfulness of man's heart. 
but also it's part of Satan's influence. We can't be naive and think that it's just all politics. It was Satan who was there that day inciting the crowd to say of the Lord Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. You remember the choice they were given? Here's Barabbas, a known terrorist in their day. He was public enemy number one, the most despised man. Given the choice between Barabbas or Jesus, they cried out, crucify Jesus. A man who had never sinned, a man who had only shown perfect love. How did that come about? Well, it was the devil bruising the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So make no mistake about it. While Satan is God's lackey, he is at work stirring up hatred, animosity, racial prejudice. The devil's behind all of that. So in verse 12, that's the contrast, this antithesis of love, this murderer here, Cain. And now thirdly, at the end of verse 12, let's, let's see the motive. So what's the reason given as to why Cain murdered his brother Abel? Well, the word murder really carries the idea of slaughter. It's like a sacrifice. It's to assassinate someone. It's used in the book of Revelation for martyrs. Those who suffer unjustly are attacked by unbelievers and their life is taken. So it's an aggressive intentional slaughter. It's taking the life of another person in assassination. So for what reason did Cain murder Abel, his brother? He tells us his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. See, Cain's deeds were his false worship. And what, he, what we should see from Genesis 4 is not so much the kind of sacrifice he brought, but it's that Abel brought both the first and the best and Cain brought some. It's almost like Abel was acting as a steward of what God had given him, recognizing it all belongs to God. And Cain was acting on his belief of ownership, and he was just trying to appease God somehow. Well, when God rejected Cain's offering, jealousy and envy arose in his heart because his brother's sacrifice was, was acceptable to God. Abel's was, sacrifice, it was acceptable, and Cain's was rejected by God. So rather than repenting and humbling himself and saying, Lord, I did not bring you the first and the best. Instead of taking responsibility, he deflected. He shifted his focus onto hatred toward his brother when Cain should have hated his own life and his own sin. But instead he hated his brother. He hated, he had, his hatred escalated to the point where he killed him. So the motive was hatred that provoked jealousy and envy. Now even for us as believers, we have to guard against a heart that's so easy to become filled with jealousy and envy towards someone. By God's grace and help and through repentance and faith, we to have to learn to be content in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And for Cain, sadly, he proved to be one of the premier examples in the entire Bible of a failure to love his brother. Now, finally, we have to see the mindset here, what our mindset should be. And that's in verse 13. He says, Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. Remember, we need to embrace this because our culture is becoming more and more hostile to Christ and His gospel. The word surprise means to marvel or to wonder. It's to be astonished or amazed or shocked. And John puts it in the negative and he says, Do not be shocked when the world hates you, just like Cain hated Abel. Don't be caught off guard. Don't let that devastate you. Don't have the expectation the world is going to love you because the more you follow Christ, the more you bear witness to Christ, the more that it's going to provoke them to hate you. And it's really since the world hates you. You know, when you're a Christian, this is no if the world hates you. It's when the world hates you. And this word hate really is an intense word. It speaks of rejection. It, it, it carries with it the idea even of persecution. The truth is we've had it so easy here in America for so many decades. But things have changed even just in the last few years in an unprecedented way. Such that now there's almost like a red laser on the forehead of every Christian. And the world hates us because of what we stand for. They hate us because we're pro-life. They, they hate us because we're pro-family. You know, the fact that we actually believe uh, that God's design uh, for mankind is a nuclear family and that God alone defines marriage and not the government. Uh, we believe God creates people as either male or female. You know, you don't find your identity in your race or in your sexuality. And we are hated because we've been and continue to be, albeit in a shrinking manner, we continue to stand in the way of, of culture who's propagating every possible ideology that goes directly against the teaching of Scripture. 
And so John is having to remind them at the end of the first century and remind us as well. And think of this. John is the last living apostle at this point as he, as he writes this. I mean, he, he has knowledge that all the other 11 have been, uh, disciples have been uh, martyred. And soon after that, he's going to be carted off to the Isle of Patmos. And he's going to uh, suffer tribulation because of his faith in Christ. I believe eventually the church in America is going to experience persecution. Maybe not martyrdom, but definitely persecution. Possibly even in the next decade. And when that happens, it's going to purify the church. Because then you won't be able to just be a Christian in name only. It might actually cost your, you your life or at least your freedom. People won't be playing church so much anymore when that kind of hatred is unleashed. And one day when the church can no longer operate, when the gospel can't be propagated anymore, then that's when Jesus will return. So John never forgot Jesus' words there to his disciples in the upper room in John 15, verses 18 and 19. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you, if you were of the world. And he's referring there to that evil world system of which surrounds us today. Everything from media and entertainment to education. I mean, they're, they're targeting five-year-olds now. A blind man can see the evil that's taking place in our culture. So Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would, would love you, would love its own. But because you would just go along with their, their agenda. Because you're not of the world, though, because I chose you out of the world, the world's going to hate you. And then in verse 23 there, he says, whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. So Jesus gave this warning here so we wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't make us stumble. He wants them and us to know uh, what it's going to be like to go out into the world. And, and John, well, so what John has to say is very relevant to us. We have to love one another. And the tighter the circle becomes, the more precious Christian fellowship is going to be. And it's going to make really the assembly of believers a much sweeter place to be. Because you're going to get hammered out there all week. And you come here to church on Sunday, not because God, only because God commands it. It's because here you're going to find someone who believes what you believe and embraces the same Savior you have. That's going to become very precious to you in the near future, I believe. And the, and the goats that are among the sheep, well, they're going to fade away. Because they're not ready to suffer persecution for the truth of the gospel. John says, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, when the world hates you. What a contrast our love for one another should be while the world around us is hating us. And then we're, we're here loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. By God's grace, may it be so for all of us. Father, thank you so much for your word today, and we ask that you'll apply it to our hearts as only you can in Jesus' name.